Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah. It, this is Dr. Dennis Taylor. I am the current president of the North Carolina Nurses Association. And this morning, it's my distinct privilege to introduce Governor Roy Cooper, who was elected as our 75th yeah. governor of okay. North Carolina in November of 2016. All right. Can we come up with something else? Governor Cooper, uh, previous uh, to being elected governor, was 16 years as our North Carolina Attorney General. And prior to that, had served as an elected member in the North Carolina House and North Carolina Senate. Governor Cooper is a native of Nashville, North Carolina, and is married to his lovely wife, Kristen, and they have three children. Governor, I know this is an extremely busy time for you right now and we certainly appreciate uh, you taking the time to join us and, uh, and talk to the nurses of the North Carolina Nurses Association. Well, thank you very much, Dennis. And my life can't be any busier than the lives of most all of your members. Dr. Cohen is on the line with me and she is going to come on after me and also engage with some question and answers. And I'm gonna step in here to the next meeting. But I, I wanted to come on to this call to just tell you from the bottom of my heart how grateful I am for all that you are doing, for the courage that it takes uh, to put yourself at risk every single day that you're out there on the front line for the compassion that you show when it must be so difficult emotionally dealing with case after case not just COVID but the other cases that you deal with uh, as well but with COVID compounding everything I know that it is so much more difficult at your work because of the additional extraordinary care and protection uh, that you have to make sure occurs. I also know that each of you have lives and some of you may have children at home or in flux with school or you're dealing with a, a sick relative, parent or grandparent and you may have uh, had hours reduced or you may have some a family member, a spouse, or someone you live with lose a job or lose hours, and it may be a more difficult financial time for you. And you're still having to be out there on the front lines fighting this battle every day, in addition to fighting the battles at home that, that a lot of other people are having to fight. So there are really no words to tell you the depth of my appreciation for the hard work that you do. And I want you to know that every single day, Dr. Cohen and I will work to try and make sure that more and more people take the steps that they need to take to protect you and your patients. Everyone should be a part of this effort to wear a mask, to social distance, to keep your hands clean, and to use common sense and caring for our brothers and sisters out there. I do hope and believe that once we get past next Tuesday and this election day is over, that having to being able to remove a number of these strident healthcare fights from the political arena will help us. I know that it's so wrong to a lot of for a lot of people to view whether or not you have a mask as some type of political notification to other people. Once we get past election day, I hope we can put that behind us and I will work to be a healer, a healing governor, a governor for everybody in this state, regardless of whether you voted for me, because we're going to have to pull together more than ever before. And we're gonna to have to rely on each other to do the things that we need to do to get on the other side of this pandemic. I'm proud of the research that's going on in North Carolina, particularly regarding the vaccine and therapeutics. I do believe that we will be able to get a vaccine soon 
I do believe that as we work to deploy that vaccine next year and provide protection for people, that we will be able to do more and more to turn the corner on this virus, to try to keep you from being overwhelmed, to try to improve our economy, to get our children back in school. Uh, and it, it, is, it will be my effort every single day, morning and noon and in the evening, to make sure we're getting us toward that goal. Uh, we've got the PPE to try to help you. We're improving our test, testing er, uh, every day. Uh, we're working on our contact tracing. We're, we're looking at everything that we can to try and to help you. Uh, I've talked to a number of you individually. Uh, you have told me how difficult this is and how frustrating it can be that your fellow North Carolinians aren't taking the steps that they need to protect you. I, do, I understand that. And I'm gonna keep working every day to make sure that it happens and to get more people on your side. But Dennis, thank you and your members for the advice that you give us, uh, for the frontline experiences you relate to us, because we know that that's important in calculating decisions that we make we're grateful for the input and uh, we're grateful for your courage and compassion and for everything that, that you do for the people of North Carolina. You, you're doing the Lord's work. I truly believe that. And I'm grateful to each and every one of you. So thank you, Dennis, for letting me get on and say a word or two to everybody. Thank you, Governor. Uh, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time and we appreciate all of the energy and effort uh, that you and your staff and the secretary and her staff uh, have all put into uh, our state response uh, to this pandemic. Um, and hopefully uh, here in a, in a week or two, uh, you'll be able to hopefully catch your breath and have a little bit of a rest. But we, we really appreciate everything you do. Well, Dennis, let me, let me say one more time too that I, I couldn't do this without uh, the best Secretary of Health and Human Services in the, in the country and Dr. Mandy Cohen. And I'm grateful for our teamwork and her significant intellectual scientific healthcare abilities as well as her uh, ability to relate to people. She's a mom of two young daughters who are going through the public school ups and downs and uh, she, she, she knows what's going on out there and I think she's able to communicate with people in a significant way. So I'm grateful for her and I'm glad that she's on uh, to talk to everybody today. Well, once again, thank you. And it is uh, it's now my privilege to introduce Secretary Mandy Cohen, Dr. Mandy Cohen to you. Since 2017, uh, Dr. Mandy Cohen has been the Secretary of Health and Human Services for North Carolina. Prior to that, she was the Chief Operating Officer and Chief of Staff for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, she's also served as Deputy Director of the Comprehensive Women's Health Services at the Department of Veteran Affairs. She's a founding member and former Executive Director of Doctors for America. Dr. Cohen received her MD degree from Yale University and also has a master's in public health from Harvard. Uh, she is educated as an internal medicine physician uh, and she is married to her husband, Samuel, uh, and has two daughters. Uh, one thing that uh, Dr. Cohen always brings up, uh, but uh, Dr. Cohen, I'm gonna preempt you this time, is that her, her mother is also a nurse practitioner uh, so Dr. Cohen certainly understands and was brought up around nursing and understands nursing and understands nursing uh, issues. Uh, and her mom had worked in emergency medicine as a nurse practitioner. And uh, Dr. Cohen, we are so happy that you are able to join us today as well. Well, thank you, Dennis. Wonderful to be with you. And Tina, thanks for your leadership and welcome to everyone. Um, thanks for giving us a bit of your time uh, today. And yes, my mom uh, is a nurse practitioner. She actually had just 
retired at the end of 2019 before all of COVID uh, started. And she was in emergency uh, medicine for all of her career. Um, and it has been really hard for her to be on the sidelines. She's actually done some um, additional uh, ways to help through telehealth. Um, uh, and and because you know the the nursing instinct and the desire to just leap towards a crisis is something I saw in my mom, and I know that we see in so much of the nursing community. So I just want to thank you um, on behalf of my mom, my whole family, and and the state of North Carolina for all that nurses are are doing through this incredibly challenging time of 2020. Um, COVID is certainly the topic that I'll spend most of my time on, but I know it's not just COVID that you're handling with all of the issues um, uh, in, in the medical system. There's still the chronic illnesses that we, we see of diabetes and COPD. Um, there, there are still the cancers that we need to fight, um, the, the heart disease we need to fight. Um, so thank you for continuing on um, making sure that folks get the preventive care they need even in the face of COVID and COVID just sort of adds to um, the, you know, the complications. And I know these are anxious times for all of us, both professionally and personally. Um, and so I just thank you for all that you're doing. I know, as the governor said, that you're, you know, we've all been impacted with this beyond our, our professional spheres and just know that we are so grateful for your sacrifice of what you're doing in your work and professional space, but we all have been know that there's sacrifice in our personal lives as well as we all try to pull together as a state and as a country and frankly as a world to try to defeat this virus. And it it does there there is this is this has been a very hard year. So thank you for all you're doing. But I will remind you as nurses, as my mom reminds me often, that nurses have incredible power. You are the most trusted member of care teams, not the doctors, the nurses. The public's trust in you know, government and, and unfortunately in science has been threatened um, frequently, um, particularly this year. Um, and that's where I think nurses can be so powerful um, as role models, um, as you think about wearing face coverings and doing the social distancing and being role models in your professional space, but also in your communities. Your trusted sources of information. I, I still, to this day, um, if there is any medical issue in my family, I call my mom. <laughs> um, uh, she is the best clinician um, that, that I know. And I'm sure you all get those same calls from family and friends, members of your churches and your community with, with various medical issues and concerns. And that's why um, I'm happy to be on today so I can answer some questions so you have the very latest information about what's happening with COVID because I know folks are, 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 are turning to you in this time of, of, um, of hardship um, and of COVID. What I can say in terms of what we're seeing right now related to COVID is unfortunately we are seeing a rise in cases in North Carolina as the rest of the country is also seeing rises in cases. I think you're seeing that in the newspaper. North Carolina has had some of our historic high days of new cases. Um, last Friday was our highest day ever of cases with 2,700 new cases in North Carolina in one day. Um, we are seeing more and more folks in the hospital. We have over 1,200 people with COVID in the hospital. That is nearing our highest, is not yet at our highest, but nearing our highest ever of hospitalizations that, that we saw back in July. Um, and, you know, it, it is a reminder that, that this virus is not gone. And as we head into the flu season, right, and into the winter, you know that flu is circulating, paraflu, other RSV, other viruses are circulating. And we know that the, as the weather cools down and the humidity goes down, that this virus has more opportunities to spread. And we're seeing that already in our numbers. Um, and that's, but I would say we also know much more about this virus than we did back in the spring. One, we, we know important prevention tools, right? We know that masks work in terms of preventing you from spreading COVID to others. We know that cloth masks are not something that prevents you from getting COVID, but they do prevent you 
from spreading your germs to other people. And that's why we're really focused on making sure that everyone wears a face covering or a mask anytime they are not with people they live with. What we're seeing now is actually spread of this virus in social gatherings, right? At home, in parties, uh, small gatherings with extended family and friends. It's because in those settings, we take down our guard. We think, well, I know them. They don't have COVID. They don't look sick. But unfortunately, I think you know this too well, that you could have COVID and not know it. And that is exactly what the face mask helps prevent. When you wear a face mask, your respiratory particles that come out of your mouth and nose can't escape out in, into the world in the same way. And we do really see that when folks are, are being good, not just about the mask, but that's important, but also about the social distancing and washing their hands, and we put all those three together, we really can drive this virus down. Um, and that's what we want to do. We've been doing a lot of work on, on communicating about the three W's, wearing, waiting, and washing. Um, we have launched a campaign called Whatever Your Reason, because we want folks to really think about why are you wearing a mask? Because again, the act of wearing a mask is protecting others um, from you, right? So it's an act of kindness in many ways, um, and an act of protection for those around you, for you to be wearing a mask. So one of my asks today for the whole nursing community, as you've been doing, is to continue to spread the word about the importance of masks, talking with your patients and friends and family, not just how face coverings work, but why they're so important for everyone to embrace, right? To prevent the, the, the mom who is fighting cancer right now, make sure that she doesn't get sick, or the grandmother who lives with their, um, with their grand, grandkids um, who, who are going to um, in-person school for the first time in these weeks, right? Those are the folks we really know are at higher risk of getting bad outcomes from COVID. And, and unfortunately, some we've seen have, have died from this. So if we work together, we can, can do this um, together. The other things I wanted to address was just a bit about vaccines, and then I'd be happy to open to uh, your questions. One, I would say we are already at the start of flu vaccine season. Flu vaccines are already available. I imagine many, many of you have already gotten your flu vaccines if you haven't get your flu shot right now. But again, another opportunity for nurses to spread the word about a tool we can all use right now to help protect us as we go into the, the winter and flu season. I will say, um, as a shout out to North Carolina, we're at a much higher vaccination rate than we have been in past years, which is great. But we're definitely hearing folks say, well, well, I'm doing the three W, so I don't need to get a flu shot. And you know, what I would say is we want to layer on as much protection as we can going into this winter. Flu shot is just another tool in our toolbox for, for protection, prevention. Um, and so it's really important that everyone get their flu shot. For, so as far as COVID vaccine, as you know, there is still scientific studies and research trials going on uh, to develop those vaccines and make sure they are both safe and effective. Those, those vaccine research studies are going on even here in North Carolina where folks have enrolled. Um, I, uh, you know, a very close family friend of ours is, um, is enrolled, actually several um, are enrolled in the vaccine trials. Maybe even you are enrolled in one of the trials and thank you for that. I expect for the first approved vaccine to be available likely in, in late December of this year. That is probably my best thinking, maybe early January. What I wanna make sure folks know is that when it is first available, it's going to be in a limited supply. Um, and because there's gonna be a limited supply, we at the state were asked to come up with a phased approach, who would get vaccines first. And so we did put together that plan and we submitted it to the federal government. But essentially we said in that plan that because there's going to be a limited supply, that in the first phase, we're going to have those who have access to a vaccine are gonna be healthcare workers, at high risk for exposure to COVID based on your work duties. So it doesn't mean every healthcare worker, but if you are someone who is going to be at higher risk for exposure to COVID based on your work duties, 
we, I would talk about those are going to be um, nurses who work in, in hospital settings um, and others, as well as nurses who may work in or other healthcare workers who work in long term care facilities. Um, after we get to some of our healthcare workers and long term care facility workers, then we move to long term care residents, as well as other adults who are at the highest risk for bad outcomes. So they're going to be adults with two or more chronic diseases. Um, uh, so those are going to be the first folks who are going to concentrate our vaccination efforts. So we actually have a two, two parts of the first phase, healthcare workers at high risk of exposure and long-term care facility staff. And then second, get to those higher risk adults like our long-term care residents, others living in congregate sitting, settings, and adults um, with two or more chronic conditions. We are enrolling providers who are going to be administering the vaccine right now. So we've already enrolled our local health departments and then our hospital systems. You likely don't have to do anything individually. Your hospital system or your federally qualified health center or your practice will do that. And we are going in stages. So we're only at the beginning of that enrollment and we're working on as I said, local health departments and hospitals, then we'll get into our long-term care settings, then we'll get into our FQHCs, and then we'll get into more private doctor's offices. Um, and again, we're doing that to align with those groups of priorities, right? The first priority is going to be healthcare workers at high risk for exposure, and that's where we will do our first distribution is going to be to those kinds of sites um, where, where those high priority folks are going to be. So we're also going to be, we are, we are working feverishly right now. I guess fever is not a good pun to make in COVID times, but we're working hard uh, on rolling out our new data collection system. There will be a new data collection system to, to do this work um, because there is different and um, unique information that we're going to need um, that our old vaccine registry was just not going to be able to handle the volume of what we're about to embark on. Right, we're going to need to be vaccinating ultimately everyone in North Carolina who wants that vaccine. Um, but I, I want to just uh, say, as a word of caution related to vaccine, is that we still have a lot more work to do to understand the science. Once the, tr the, the, the trials end, they will go through a formal approval process at the federal government through the FDA. I will say I continue to be reassured by the very transparent and public process that the FDA is going to go through related to approving that vaccine. I continue to you know, watch that very closely, look at the science and the data. We have seen a couple of the trials, the research studies on vaccines be paused um, within, the, within recent weeks. They've had a participant who had gotten sick and they need to investigate that. Was it related to the vaccine or not? And I think that is actually showing the process working as intended, so that by the time we get to an, an approval process, that they have gone through all of those safety protocols to make sure this is safe um, and also can prove that this is something that is going to be effective. But I will say that even like the flu vaccine, as you well know, the flu vaccine is something we've had for a long time, is not perfectly effective. It's not 100% effective. You can still get the flu if you've gotten a flu shot, but the good thing about getting a flu shot is if you do get the flu, it will be less severe, and that's a positive as well. And so I think we are going to see um, a vaccine that comes forward for COVID be similar in that it's not going to be 100% effective. Um, we'll see what level of effectiveness is when we see the research data, um, but that is, that is um, some of what we, we anticipate to learn as we move forward here. Okay, so that's a lot about vaccines that I hope I saw, had seen some questions in the chat ahead of time that were a lot about vaccines, so hopefully I um, and as I answered some of those proactively, but now I'd love to turn over and see if there are um, others who have, have questions. Thank you. Uh, there are a couple of, of folks who have uh, written in some things and um, one of them from one of our members is in primary care, so much of our time is spent helping people navigate the testing criteria and recommendations for travel and work clearance especially for smaller employers who do not have a robust employee health department. How can we get clearer information to share with patients and North Carolina citizens? 
Sure, great question. So first I would say we have very comprehensive guidance um, for employers on our website. Um, we have checklists for symptom checking, as well as helping folks understand when, when do you need to do contact tracing if you have an employee, what does that mean in terms of closing things down or not. Um, so there's um, guidance there. And what I would also say is that you don't need a negative COVID test to return to work. Once you've been sick with COVID, we actually use both a time and a symptom mechanism to decide about returning to work. Again, that guidance also on, on our website um, so that, that folks know that it's not, you don't need a negative test to return to work. So we've been clear on that as well. But hopefully, um, and, and uh, Dennis, if helpful, I'm, I'm happy for my team to pull some of those resources specifically if you want to attach it to the notes of, um, of this presentation as we go forward. That would be great. And obviously the website that your department has built is uh, chock full of information. And uh, I reference it uh, every time I get a request for an interview uh, to go on and find the most recent information. And it's uh, mm -hmm. very helpful. Um, one of the other questions and, and one that I had as well, one of our members asked, do you feel the spike in number of cases last week is associated with students returning to school. Mm -hmm. And I'll piggyback off of that with a report that was just released by the American Academy of Pediatrics that said in the last two weeks, there's been a 14% increase in pediatric cases and that now pediatric cases uh, are now over 10% of all COVID cases. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess my question is, do you continue to feel comfortable with the plan that we have for school attendance? Yeah, great question. So what I would say about our current numbers, actually the, the, the fastest growing group of people who are getting COVID are actually older. We were actually seeing folks um, 18 to 24 really driving our numbers back in the August and early September timeframe when we went back to university, when universities and colleges opened. So that was really driving our numbers, the 18 to 24 year olds. Now we're actually seeing most of our numbers being driven here in North Carolina um, by those that are, are older. And when we look specifically at schools, you can also see this on our website. We do report any clusters in schools down to, we give the name of the school um, and the address. Um, and what we are seeing, and a cluster is five or more cases, are often seeing is those clusters tend to dominate in the adults um, and not in the students. Interesting. Doesn't mean the students can't get it and can't transmit it, um, but but it we are definitely seeing that adults seem to be uh, contracting COVID and then uh, giving it to others more often, and that that bears out in the published data as well. We continue to see that particularly elementary age children seem to get COVID less often, they get less severely ill when they have it, and they tend to transmit it less often. Now, less often doesn't mean never. So we definitely do see pediatric cases. Kids can get sick from COVID and they certainly can transmit it, but it does seem to be less. Um, and so what I would say is that the plans that we put together related to school all have very extensive um, safety protocols embedded in that, meaning first, everyone was, must wear a mask no matter what, teachers, staff, students, all the time, um, right? So that's number one. Then you have to do social distancing. Then you have to do screening. Then you have to wipe down high traffic areas um, and, and do the cleaning. So there are a lot of protocols built into any one of the, the ways in which we go, go forward. Um, and so we'll continue to look at our, our trends um, and to see what kinds of clusters. But as of right now, we continue to be comfortable with the current recommendations because of those extensive protocols that we have put in no matter what plan a district would choose when they would go back in person. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanna be respectful of your time. Um, and I guess my final question is, what can we uh, both as individual nurses and as an association do to 
prepare and help with the vaccine distribution or administration and to encourage the public mm -hmm. uh, to participate in a vaccine program once one gets rolled out. Well, thank you, Dennis, for that. I think there's so much nurses can do. And I would encourage us to start with the focus on the flu vaccine, help folks understand how vaccines work, that vaccines are safe and effective, and to use the flu vaccine as a way to build trust and build awareness um, in vaccines overall. And then I would make sure that you are following along closely with us as we learn more about the COVID vaccine that is likely to, to uh, be approved maybe late this year, early next year. We also have communications materials about, um, about vaccines overall. We have a, a, a slide deck that sort of goes through how a vaccine works, and what, how, how folks can think about um, vaccines going forward. Would love for, again, that's something, Dennis, I'm happy to share with you and you can share with the whole membership um, if nurses want to use that to educate um, others in their communities. Again, because I know you are such a trusted source of information, we want to make sure you have what you, what you need. So I would start with educating folks about the flu vaccine, because that is something they could do right now. And I think it builds um, that ability to talk about vaccine before there is a COVID vaccine. And once there is, um, for, for folks to know a couple of key things, one, there's going to be a limited supply at first. But also, I think, because nurses are going to be some of the first folks who are vaccinated because you are frontline healthcare workers, I think talking about um, the fact that you have gotten a vaccine and your experience with this and then and then sharing with folks about why vaccines are important and they can be safe and effective, I think is going to be critical. So I think we can all work together uh, on that going forward. So a lot, a lot to do and certainly nurses have a huge role to play in that. So I look forward to working with you on it. Well, thank you very much. And uh, once again, we just, uh, we just want to express our gratitude and appreciation for all of the hard work of you and your staff um, in, in terms of response to this and, and all the issues regarding the health care uh, of the citizens of the state. Um, and uh, we, we really appreciate uh, your time, your dedication, your passion, um, and uh, please always either you or your staff reach out to us if there's anything at all that you feel like we can do and contribute uh, to help. Great. Thank you so much. Stay well, everyone. Do the three W's. Thank you.